Questions. Important part of life, right? It's how we learn things. That's no surprise to those of you who are, find yourselves around young children, right? I saw a study the other day that said children between the ages of four and nine ask an average of 300 questions a day, right? So that means between preschool and third grade, that's over half a million questions. Um, sometimes that can get a little bit uh, annoying and sometimes maybe inappropriate, but it's the basic tool of learning. Uh, and that, that holds true for faith formation as well as all the other kinds of learning that we do as well. Questions become important. There's times when blind obedience is called for, right? Where some things are just not up for debate. It's part of trusting someone. Sometimes the correct answer is, because I said so, I'm the parent, right? Um, there's times where that is the way it goes. Uh, time for where we don't debate, we don't question, we simply acknowledge that, that I trust you. Uh, a couple weeks ago we had the story of Abraham and Isaac. We saw this amazing kind of trust that does not question. But other times, questions become a very, very important part of process, of learning what faith is all about. If all our kids show is blind obedience, how will they learn to think and decide for themselves? So part of our parenting job or grandparenting job is to give them the tools they need in order to make good decisions for themselves. And oftentimes that comes by learning how to ask the right questions. Well, that's the case in our reading today as well as we come to the story of, of Moses. Uh, it's another example of how God uses deeply flawed people to bless the world. Context. Let's look at our, we have our timeline up on the wall, our, our bigger picture. We started a few weeks ago with creation. Then we made our, we, our main character, with Abraham and his son Isaac, and then last week his son Jacob. Um, but we're making a big jump. We're going to go all the way from Abraham. We're going to jump 500 years forward to Moses. And in between, we have this huge time in here where they were slaves in, in Egypt. So we have to remember that if we're going to know for the story to make sense, we have to talk about what happens in between, in between our stories. Because last week we were talking about, ja remember talking about Jacob? He cheated his way into being the bearer of the blessing that we have, but God uses him anyway. God blesses him with 12 sons. They become the genesis of the 12 tribes of Israel. But a famine drives Jacob's family to be refugees, and they flee from the land that God had given them. They go to Egypt where they are welcomed at first, but as they grow in number, fear on the part of the Egyptians lead them to be enslaved. And they spend 400 years then in Egypt as slaves. And may say, well, whoa, wait a second. I thought God promised to Abraham and to Isaac and Jacob that he would bless them and make them a great nation and all the world would be blessed through them. But now for hundreds and hundreds of years, they are slaves. There's no apparent blessing. And we hear these words at the end of the second chapter of Exodus. It says, The Hebrew people cried out for help, and God heard their loud cries, and he did not forget the promise he had made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he knew what was happening to his people, and he felt sorry for them. So God raises up a leader to save, to deliver his people, a leader named Moses. Exodus 2 tells us the story of his birth being uh, and it, it sort of leaves off then with, with Moses being rescued from the Nile where his, uh, they had hidden him. Pharaoh's daughter finds him and be, becomes raised uh, in Pharaoh's very own household. Chapter 3 of Exodus begins like this. One day Moses was taking care of the sheep and goats and his father-in-law Jethro in the priest of Midian. And we go, wait a minute. <laughs> I thought, he was, I thought he was growing up in Pharaoh's household uh, in Egypt, and now all of a sudden he's a shepherd in Midian working for, uh, uh, for his father-in-law. So we, we, can't, we don't read every verse of Exodus, so we have to depend on you knowing some of the story or at least going back and looking at that. Um, so the part that happens in between our readings here is that I forgot to mention Moses murdered somebody, right? Um, had to run for his life to try to hide the fact. Hollywood tries to soften this story sometimes. Uh, I've seen a couple versions of the Exodus story where he didn't really mean to kill the Egyptian. He was, you know, just sort of get things got out of hand. 
Um, but the Bible's clear. This is premeditated, deliberate murder. Uh, Moses is guilty of a felony, and if he stayed, he would face prison and death. And so he doesn't want to do that, so he runs away. And he runs away to this land called Midian, uh, where he starts a new life, uh, sort of witness protection plan, takes a, a new identity, uh, gets married, could have lived the rest of his life there, end of the story. But God has another plan. Let's go back to the book of Exodus. Moses decided to lead the flock across the desert to Sinai, a holy mountain. There an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a burning bush. Moses saw the bush was on fire, but it was not burning up. This is strange, he said to himself. I'll go over, I'll see why the bush isn't burning up. Now if Moses had not asked himself the question, why is this bush not burning up, he might have well just gone on and lived out his days herding sheep. But he didn't. He was curious. He asked the question. He investigated. Back to Gen uh, Exodus. When the Lord uh, saw Moses coming near the bush, he called him by name. And Moses answered, Here I am. God replied, Don't come any closer. Take off your sandals, for the ground on which you are standing is holy. I am the God who was worshipped by your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, it's not clear whether Moses knew much of anything about God at this time. He may have heard about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but he didn't grow up Jewish, remember? He grew up as an Egyptian. I'm sure his family all worshipped the Egyptian gods. Uh, now, in Midian, there were the Midianite gods that probably his family uh, worshipped. Remember, there's still, there was no scripture there was no Ten Commandments yet. There was no organized religion with priests and temples that we would call Judaism. All that was still to come. All we have is a voice calling from a burning bush. Back to Exodus. Moses was afraid to look at God, so he hid his face. And the Lord said, I've seen how my people are suffering as slaves in Egypt. I've heard them beg for my help because of the way they are being mistreated. I feel sorry for them, and I have come to rescue them from the Egyptians. I will bring my people out of Egypt to a land where there is a good, uh, to a country where there is a good land, rich with milk and honey. I will give them the land where the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites now live. My people have begged for help. I've seen how cruel the Egyptians are to them. Now go to the king. I'm sending you to lead my people out of his country. Which leads Moses to ask another question. Who am I to go to the king and lead your people out of Egypt? And God replies, not with a great reason. He doesn't point out the wonderful leadership qualities that God has been looking for that he finds in Moses. Says nothing at all about Moses' abilities whatsoever is why God has chosen him. God simply replies with the same words that he spoke to Jacob, his great, 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 great grandfather. God replies, I will be with you. I will bless you. And all will know that I am the one who sent you when you worship me on this mountain after you've led your people out of Egypt. Moses has another question. I'll tell the people of Israel that the God of their, their ancestors worshipped has sent them to them, but what, should I, but what if they should say to me, ask me, what is your name? God said to Moses, I am the eternal God. Tell them that the Lord whose name is I am has sent you. This is my name forever. It's a name that the people must use from now on. Well, that's about as clear as mud. Uh, your name is I am. That's not really a name. It's more of a riddle, more of a, a mystery, which is to say that sometimes the answers we seek don't always make things easier. But Moses doesn't challenge it. He asks another question. Suppose everyone refuses to listen to my message and no one believes that you really appeared to me. That's really a pretty good point. Here he is. He's a, a guilty felon who hears a voice from a bush from a God people have never heard from, and he asks people to risk everything. I mean, what could go wrong with that plan, right? 
The Lord says, what's in your hand? A walking stick, Moses replied. Throw it down, the Lord commanded. So Moses threw the stick to the ground. Immediately, it turned into a snake. Moses jumped back. Pick it up by the tail, the Lord told him. And Moses did this. The snake turned back into a walking stick. Do this, the Lord said. Israelites will believe that you have seen me, the God who was worshipped by their ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God goes on and gives him a couple more miraculous signs that he can show to the people to try to convince them. But Moses is still not convinced. He says, I've never been a good speaker. I wasn't one before you spoke to me. I'm not one now. I'm slow at speaking. I can never think of what to say. But the Lord answered, Who makes people able to speak? Who makes them deaf or unable to speak? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Don't you know I'm the one who does these things? Now go. When you speak, I will be with you and give you the words to say. Moses begged, Lord, please send someone else to do this. The Lord became irritated with Moses. He said, what about your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know he's a good speaker. He's already on his way here to visit you. He'll be happy to see you again. And Aaron, uh, Aaron will speak to the people for you and you will be like me telling Aaron what to say. I will be with you both as you speak. I will tell each of you what to do. And so the story continues. Uh, the book of Exodus is a great read. If you haven't read the book of Exodus, you really should go back and read it. But other than being a, a great story, what, is this, what does this mean for us? One of the things it means for me is that it's okay to ask questions. It's how we grow in our relationship with God. It reminds us that it's not just about getting the answers. Moses had all kinds of answers, uh, but sometimes we need to get to that point where we simply step out and trust. Trust that we won't have all the answers before we start. Trust that God will be with us wherever we go. If we think that God couldn't use us, we need to think again. If God could use Jacob, if God could use Moses, then God can use us, and God does use us. God speaks. The question is, are we listening? So wonderful, where's Joan? Joan, why don't you come up back up here? Let's, uh, there's this wonderful old, uh, old song, not old song, it's a relatively new song, but it's, it's a song about hearing God's call uh, and responding when God speaks that we might respond to that. The song is called, Here I Am, Lord. Uh, we heard that phrase again and again all the last couple of weeks. Every time God speaks, the first response is, Here I am. Uh, let's rise as we sing, Here I Am, Lord.